Hello, welcome to Pod Songs. I'm Jack Stafford. I interview inspiring people in service to others as inspiration for a new song. Today's guest is a very famous American journalist. He started his career. One of his first jobs was Jimmy Carter's chief speechwriter. That's starting at the top now. He's been a national correspondent for The Atlantic for many years. His work has also appeared in most of the leading magazines in America. He lived in China for quite a few years as a correspondent there. He's written 11 books and he's won the National Book Award in America. His last book, together with his wife, is called Our Towns, uh, where he flies over America and lands in different places and has a chat to the locals. It's just been made into a HBO series. I think I have enough to chat about with James Fallows. So great, nice to uh, have this. That this has come to fruition. I appreciate it. No worries. Thanks. Well, thanks for taking the time to speak to me. My pleasure. And and so a technical question. So I don't need to manage any recording, right? You are doing the recording. Yeah, it's all done through great. the browser here. Good. So the idea with this conversation is that uh, because I've been a songwriter for many years, <laughs> just as you are a journalist, you need to speak to people for inspiration. So there's no, uh, I don't have a string of questions for you here. Yeah. We could just chat for an hour and whatever you'd like to talk about, whatever you think is inspiring. Great. Well, I'd be happy to, uh, to, to do that. And um, so we are not actually starting yet, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so it's, I, I can tell you about the sort of, the reason I was so interested in, in your um, proposition is that the niche you're exploring on your your podcast is one that I've been involved in my journalistic career too. So I can explain the connection. And and so if you just give me sort of open-ended, uh, like we're talking at, over breakfast, as I've heard in one of your recent podcasts, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm happy to, to do that. Yes, please go ahead whenever you're ready. I mean, how was okay. the BBC interview? That was a- BBC interview was fine. It's for, they're doing a special about Joe Biden to run before his um, inauguration. So I was talking about um, how he's been a figure on the American scene for a long time. And an underappreciated part of the Biden saga is how, in his own mind, he's still this dashing young man who was the youngest person ever to take office in the Senate, who was a very young chairman of various Senate committees, who ran for president in 1988. You know, he was in his, sort of the same age that John Kennedy had been or Bill Clinton had been but before winning office. And now he's seen, of course, by the world as he's going to be the oldest person. The, 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 the saga of life we all go through of uh, the self-image having to adjust to the world's image. So, uh, and, and a related point I was making is it's likely that Joe Biden taking office at age 78 is going to a, do a better job in this role than if he had won when he was in his 40s or when he ran against Obama back in 2008 when he was in his 60s, that the the ripening of experiences and disappointments and successes and dead ends, these will probably make him better and give him more passion, recognizing this is an opportunity he has and he has to do something with it. So that's what I was talking about with the BBC. Okay, yeah, he must have <laughs> must have been really waiting for this for a long time then. <laughs> Yes, yeah, he was trying to, you know, Biden's first run was in was in 88. Uh, and he thought he was going to be a, a direct step from the youngest ever senator to a young president. But uh, it's been a, a different saga. And you followed it all the way. I, I've been involved in journalism for a long time. And just to for the um, <laughs> on the chance there are any listeners of the podcast who are not aware of the very the meandering path that has led me to joining you, Mr. Stafford, on your show right now. It's I've, I've been almost all of my um, my life a working journalist. Uh, the one exception was uh, back during the Jimmy Carter administration, back at the dawn of time. I was then in my mid twenties and worked for him as a speechwriter in the White House. But most of the rest of the time, I've been a journalist. I've lived about um, half that time, a little more in the U.S. Half other parts of the world, in China for many years, in Japan for a number of years, Malaysia. My wife and I lived in England. We got married there. We've been in Africa extensively. And I realized that the the theme 
that has gone through the questions I've tried to answer, which are sort of like the ones you explore in the podcast, is what allows people and organizations and societies to work, to function, to rise, to deal with disappointment, um, to not be become crass. And so I've, I've looked for ways to kind of have um, inspiration, sources of, of inspiration. And I can, I can take you through different uh, steps along that log road, if you would like. <laughs> Please go ahead. Yes. <laughs> you can tell me at any point, okay, that's enough. Even for a podcast, this is too much. <laughs> you can, can say. So the, um, there's a, everybody who listens to your podcast will know about California, but not everybody who listens will know about the crucial difference, very much like the North and the South of England between the coast and the interior of California. The coast of California is like the south of England. It is what where all the, um, uh, the what's, what the world knows about. It's Los Angeles, it's San Francisco, it's San Diego, it's all the, the big companies, et cetera. Then there's a ridge of mountains. And then there's interior California, which is, uh, it's like interior U.S. It's, it's um, agricultural, it's smaller town, it's not places people have heard of. So I grew up in a town in interior California little place called Redlands, California, which was an orange growing town. And uh, my parents had come there after World War II from sort of a, um, a working class uh, background in Philadelphia. They, the military brought my dad, the Navy brought him to the West Coast and he, he stayed there. And so I've always been interested in in the tensions between different kinds of American identities, different American uh, regional possibilities, the parts that are fancy, the parts that feel looked down on, and how people use the motivation of being uh, of their self-image, their community image, to be able to to uh, act in life. And so I, I went to college in the East Coast, met my wife there, went to graduate school in England, lived there for a while, and came back to the U.S. to begin um, a, a time as, as a journalist. And I worked with, with Carter soon after that. And the drama for me, sort of the question I've wanted, I found fascinating in endless iterations is, um, how does China deal with coming what it thinks of as the hundred years of humiliation when it was felt like it was dismembered and the ways that it tries to uh, restore some sense of greatness and possibility without becoming obnoxious about it and how uh, does uh, the united states which has this uh crazed um by which crazed i mean not entirely accurate american dream of the possibility for people to remake lives how does it deal with the parts of that that are true and the parts of it that are fictitious and that are unfair and that are exclusionary? And so uh, as I've uh, written a number of books and a whole ton of magazine articles, I have um, been exploring that, including a project my wife and I have done over the last now seven years where we've used my avocation of being a small plane pilot to go in our little propeller plane to smaller towns all around the country and try to try to understand um, how life seems in its disappointments and its opportunities in South Dakota and in northern Mississippi and in Panhandle, Oklahoma, and in Rust Belt, um, Ohio, or, or Pennsylvania. And we've come out of that process with a surprisingly positive message about human possibility, community possibility, national possibility that we didn't expect before we began the journey. Wow. Yeah, I saw the, the, this book, uh, you flew to all these different places and <laughs> just dropped in and started chatting to people or you, you made appointments? Or? So the the backdrop was for, for a long time, I've liked flying little airplanes. We have a little single engine propeller plane. And just as there is a difference between the north of England, and the south of England, so too there's a difference between the propeller plane world and the jet plane world. <laughs> yeah, These right. are sort of like little flying um uh, they're like little flying Volkswagen Beetles or something, but they, they you you fly at low altitude, you you see the world, and because we had done this for a number of years and across the country, we'd seen how much of the U.S. is available through these little tiny airports that exist in places you would never go on an airliner or an interstate highway or whatever. So we had a long background of being places like um, Rock Springs, Wyoming, 
or Diamond, Oklahoma, or you know, you, you name a million other other places. And so we we thought when we came back from China, we lived in China for a number of years and written a number of books about it. We thought this was after the 0809 financial cra- collapse. We wanted to say we know from all the reports what's happening in New York and Seattle and Los Angeles. We don't know how people are recovering elsewhere. And so we spent over a period of several years, we would go to a place, we'd typically spend about two weeks there. We would land usually on a Sunday afternoon and we'd find some little motel. The next day or two, we'd go to the uh, crew of usual suspects, to the uh, mayor and the newspaper editor or the radio broadcaster or somebody from the schools or somebody from some other uh, company and say, what's the story of this town? Who makes things run here? Who should we talk with to learn what's happening here in Huntington, West Virginia? or in Greenville, South Carolina. And we usually, at the end of a week, we'd have seen dozens of people. Typically, we'd go away for a week or two to sort of digest and then come back for a second dip. And the, the, uh, th- that was the process we did, starting from 2013 through the middle of 2017, when we wrote this book and then spent much of last year before the lockdown making a movie with HBO about it, which will be out in about two or three months. Because oh, I've heard <laughs> when I think of America, I think of road trips. Everyone's I don't think I've ever heard of anyone flying across and landing in different places. <laughs> there is a specialist genre <laughs> of these kinds of projects and, and books. There is a wonderful book by a man named Rinker Buck called Flight of Passage about when he and his brother, who were then teenagers, when they did something similar to this in the little Piper Cub airplane back in the 1960s. They would be my contemporaries, baby boomer people, and they had been flying since they were kids, and they they, they did this. There are um, uh, a man named William Langowisha, whose father, Wolfgang Langowisch, was sort of the great pioneer writer about aviation. He was a German pe- test pilot who moved to the U.S. And uh, William uh, is a magazine writer and book writer who has also been a flyer all his life. And he's written some books in the same vein, too. So it's the a argument I make in the book, which maybe you and your artiste role will appreciate, is that A hundred years ago, when flying was first being invented, and when it was much, much more dangerous than it is now, um, there was an assumption that anybody who was an artist or a philosopher or a professor or a writer would, of course, want to become a pilot. Because the way you see the world is so different and so unique in human history, and it's entirely different from being in an airliner. Uh, When you're an airliner at 35,000 feet, you're too far away. Mm -hmm. You can't see things. When you're flying at 2,000 feet, it's interesting for the same reason that people like going onto the Empire State Building or some other tall tower and Mm -hmm. sitting there because you can see the logic of towns and you can see the things they're hiding, like prisons. You can see the things they feature like they're downtown. You can see why towns are where they are with rivers and all that. So uh, it's that that's also one of the motifs of the book. What you learn about the logic of landscape by seeing it from 2000 feet. Uh-huh. Reminds me, I've been in a hot air balloon and just floated. And that was a beautiful mm-hmm. experience. Seeing that you really yeah. people sc- you can hear people shouting up to you. And, <laughs> and where were you doing that? I've done it in Italy. Yeah. yeah. And, and there, you know, you have, of course, the terrain and you can see all the, the just um, which is, you know, I have something I have never done is skydiving. I am terrified of that. And <laughs> I have not been in a, in a hot air balloon either, uh, nor nor flown helicopters myself. But I, but I like flying airplanes again for that hot air balloon effect of you can. And with an airplane, of course, you're moving through it faster than you are a balloon. But it's, it's the same appeal. But you did this trip primarily for the people to learn about America. Uh, yes. And there was a um, the initial round of snark that people might say, oh, you know, a flyover book. And so of the years we spent doing this, probably half of 1% was time in the airplane. And the other 99.5% was time on the ground, uh, seeing these little, um, the l- little towns. And the main politics type message we had or inspiration type message is that we were doing this travel in a time when 
uh, you know, Donald Trump was rising in his campaign and there were all these sort of frayings of the American national public. And our argument was <clears throat> that, that if you asked people, if the first thing you asked people when you showed up is, what do you think about some white hot national issue, Trump or Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama or you name it, in a way there was no going back because you had just, you know, you sort of started off on the area where people were most polarized. If you didn't ask them that, um, number one, it might never come up. And number two, you'd find people being really interesting and engaging and, and, and thoughtful about uh, what the future of their town was going to be and how changing uh, sea level and changing rainfall and changing everything else is going to affect them and what that would have to how the town would have to be different to attract younger people to come back and how the town's sense of itself was different from its past to its future. And so people were really uh, smart. If you ask people those things, they're smart. If you ask them about any polarizing national issue, you never hear anything new. <laughs> so that, that's why we avoided doing it. <laughs> and were you, because it's safe to say you're not a Trump supporter, is it, uh, were you surprised at some of the reactions you got? So the, um, I, I've, I mentioned in an offhand way, and I make clear whenever I, I worked in politics, when I was age 25, 26, 27, I worked for a Democratic president in, in the White House, so Jimmy Carter. So I, I, one time in my life, worked in politics for a Democrat. And my case, the reason I have been not a supporter of Donald Trump is not because he had Republican Party policies, because there are lots of Republicans I respect. Mitt Romney is a very, he would have been a very um, successful president, even though he he, uh, he beat, he ran against Barack Obama. Uh, the first George Bush, who was a Republican, was a very distinguished person, etc. It's that the, there are, there are parts of the job of being president, which I know about from having worked for one and from having right. seen them over the decades, uh, only part of the job is your actual policies. A lot of the job is being, you know, it, it's not, since there have only been men in the American presidency so far, there's, it's technically accurate to say the national father, but that has connotations I don't mean. You're, you're the national, the national parent in various mm -hmm. ways that when something terrible happens, when there's a mass shooting, when there's a disaster, there's somebody who needs to be able to show that, that he or she feels what people are going through and also can offer, um, offer both empathy, but also some kind of confidence. You know, we've been through things before. If what was the reason Winston Churchill was the leader he was, the reason Franklin Roosevelt was the leader he was at the same time was recognizing the hardship and shock, but also expressing some confidence. And that's what you need a national leader to do for a country as fractious as the United States, whose founding idea is e pluribus unum. You can take anybody from any place and make them into Americans. A president needs to have the sense of inclusiveness, mm, mm. that we are all in this together as opposed to my people and your people. You know, politics is always divisive, but the tone has to be us rather than them. And so it, it's for reasons like this of differences, not, not about policy, but about comportment and duty and inspiration mm. and hope versus fear. Um, th those are the reasons why uh, I was not a supporter of, of, of his. And uh, um, can I tell you um, one other, <laughs> I mean, I, I have a microphone here, I'm going, <laughs> and, you can always, and you can always cut this. <laughs> so I'll tell, tell you a story that stuck with us. This was in the um, August of 2016. For American listeners, that was two, three months before the national election, the election where people thought Hillary Clinton was going to win, and in fact, Donald Trump became president. Um, Deb and I were in the city of Dodge City, Kansas. Any of your listeners who've ever seen the old Western gun smoke will know of Dodge Smitty, Dodge City. I've, I've heard of it, yeah. <laughs> and it was Mayor of, uh, Sheriff Matt Dillon and all that. So it's, a, it's the classic Wild West town. Uh, in movies and in TV shows for uh, of an earlier era. Interestingly now, it's mainly a Latino town. And the reason is it's a giant meatpacking center. And the meatpacking industry in the U.S. 
is largely immigrant staffed, people from Mexico, from Nicaragua, other places. So Dodge, Dodge City, which was a classic, mainly white cowboy town in the American imagery, is now that still cowboy town. It has this kind of Disneyland scenery downtown where you can see where movies were shot. But its population is probably 60% Latino now. And you have an interesting divide where the town's leaders, the business leaders and some of the political power are older white people and the city's rising population are younger Latino people. Um, simultaneously, uh, the town and its leaders was very, very conservative and Donald Trump supporting in its national outlook. The, there was a, a, a Trump carried the, the city with a strong vote. But when it came to its own operations, they were doing everything possible to accommodate and make welcome what they thought of as the future of Dodge City. And so you had a number of these uh, white families are making sure their children were learning Spanish as they grew up and having uh, offices for consular services for people from Mexico. And hmm. uh, the guy who was the city manager, the city financial officer, had been a, a, an immigrant from Mexico as a child. You know, technically he was a under the Dreamer Act and could have been uh, deported, but you know, the town recognizes this man, Ernesto is one of our leading citizens. So it was the contrast between that local level inclusiveness that was complex and, reach, uh, and rich and sort of human when they were talking about people with their own, their own sphere of influence and a very much more black and white, one-dimensional view of politics whenever, you, whenever the national political issues came up. So that's my Dodge City story. <laughs> that's funny, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, how... <sighs> How much do you think people are affected? Like if in Europe we were voting for the president of Europe, for example, it wouldn't doesn't really affect us too much. But we might spend all, it might take over the television for a long time. But is that are they that touched by in America? There, there is a there's a huge range of American presidents in their prominence and their effectiveness and the way in which they sort of hog the microphone. A theme that is on my mind at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so they're, they're, you know, if you ask people who are the great presidents in in American history, Abraham Lincoln is always at the top of the list because he survived the worst crisis in American history, which was the company coming, a country coming apart in the Civil War. And then people will usually talk about George Washington at the founding of the country and Franklin Roosevelt and and a half dozen others. And what is in common? For them is it was a time of great crisis and okay. it was a winston churchill type situation uh, a very similar um role in the national um, iconography there's another whole range of presidents who people can hardly remember the names of you know the sequence of presidents in the 1870s 1880s 1890s it's Rutherford B. Hayes and Grover Cleveland and Chester Allen Arthur and some other ones and even I, who have spent my life, I can't really <laughs> tell you which one came after which one. Between Ulysses Grant and Theodore Roosevelt, there's kind of this big, big gray zone. Well, maybe they did and, a good job, you know, because they kept, well, they kept their head, <laughs> next, head down. <laughs> yes, so that, that is the, the argument that, for example, Gerald Ford, um, or, uh, or in his way, Dwight Eisenhower. You know, Dwight Eisenhower was a famous world-saving general. But as a president, he was sort of a he was stepping away from from the spotlight. And a lot of the things he did, he uh, built the national highway system and he got the space program going and he got um, uh, schools improved, et cetera. So there are some some presidents that are not remembered because they did a bad job, some because it was was calmer. But I, I guess what I'm saying is there are certain there is a role which the UK equivalent would obviously be the royal family. There are certain occasions where, um, and people have often mentioned, it's a problem for the U.S. that the head of state and the head of government are the same person. Because there are times when you need a head of state to be the national leader, mm -hmm. to say things in time of crisis that a, um, that, that a good sovereign can do. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the U.S., they are the same. There's no, there is no head of state other than the head of government for, for the president. And so at certain times... Uh, the president can affect the national mood by the, the either the confidence or the the bitterness that, that he projects to bring the people together like you were saying before uh, and and i'll give you an example um here are a couple examples that since my role was as a speechwriter 
me stuck in my mind. Um, back in the early 80s, there was this uh, horrific explosion of a space shuttle for the United States. You know, this was, I think, the Challenger. It was a minute or two into its, its flight. Um, there, this was the first um, space shuttle trip where they had a public school teacher who was aboard. It was part of, you know, bringing the democratizing experience of going to space. And there was a uh, international audience watching this thing, remember, and it was yeah. going up. Yeah, and then horrifically, it exploded, and mm. everybody was killed aboard. And Ronald Reagan was the president then, and this is the kind of thing where a president comes on to again express the two emotions that i think are part of any leaders that, that, that there are two and a half things that any leader does in time of crisis mm -hmm. the first is to express empathy and awareness of the pain and the fear and the suffering so you you show that that this is a terrible moment it's a terrible tragedy we we, we all all feel that you express that you then express confidence and hope it is dark now, but it will not be dark forever. Okay. And we have. You know, <laughs> it's a cetera, quick speech writing guide. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. So those are the first two uh, empathy and confidence. And then the two and a half is a plan. Here's what we're going to do. And I could give you 60 other illustrations. For example, Obama after mass shootings or George W. Bush after 9 11, but this transcends, um, transcends party. Mm. So, yes, that, that's the speech writing guide. Because <laughs> when I was researching you, obviously, you know, you started out as Jimmy Carter. So I went through Jimmy Carter's career yeah. and speeches seem to be quite prominent po points in his career. And um, I saw there was this, <laughs> this crisis, of, but you'd left by this crisis of confidence speech. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, and that was, it was a, I can talk about three speeches he gave that were really important, only one of which I was involved in. So therefore, I can talk about these <laughs> that with, one went with well. dispassion. <laughs> no, no, I mean, that was actually the most troublesome of, of them. Oh. <laughs> so there was one that that sort of put Jimmy Carter on the map, much like Joe Biden. You know, um, Joe Biden thinks of himself as a young hotshot, even though the world sees him as this oldest ever president. So too, Jimmy Carter when he started out, he was this dashing young pop culture rock and roll figure. president. Yeah, rock and roll president. Exactly. I, I taped that uh, film uh, when it was aired two days ago, or when it aired. I haven't seen it yet. So by the time uh, we next talk, I will will have have seen that. Um, but and part of the reason he had this hipster mode is that Hunter S. Thompson, then a very sort of famous Gonzo journalist in the U.S., um, followed Carter around and heard. Uh, Carter's famous Law Day speech in 1974. Carter was then governor of Georgia. The Law Day speech was um, because, you know, this Law Day <laughs> in the U.S. during the 20th century became May 1st. This was the alternative to May Day. Okay. This was how the U.S. could show it was not communist. It was it was uh, celebrating um, the Soviet Union was then celebrating May Day. The U.S. would celebrate Law Day. So Carter was giving his May 1st May Day speech in 1974. And it became what we think of as a sort of Bernie Sanders opus uh, now okay. about how the law was rigged against people, how the Vietnam War had been this racist war, about how the little person needed a better um, uh, chance, how lawyers were more often a tool of, of privilege than justice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And Hunter Thompson thought, holy Jesus, you know, yeah. this is really quite the speech from this governor of Georgia. And so uh, Hunter S. Thompson followed Carter around. He wrote a long piece in Rolling Stone magazine mainly about this speech. And so you could argue that Carter became the sense of a sort of Bernie Sanders of Georgia um, coming out of uh, in, in the Nixon era on the basis of a speech he gave that was mainly extemporized because Carter was a very good extemporaneous speech, speaker. So that was one speech that was before my time. Okay. <laughs> there was another speech that was after my time, which was the famous um, crisis of confidence mm -hmm. speech a.k.a. malaise, even though Carter didn't use that that word. And this was when things were really going to hell for the U.S. There was uh, another oil crisis. There was a Iranian hostage crisis, which I won't even get into. It was, it was really a bad time. There was no pandemic, but essentially everything else was going wrong. Um, and so Carter, 
whose popularity ratings were plummeting, went off to Camp David, the presidential retreat, spent about 10 days there, called in people to talk with him. And they did this presidential address on the national crisis of confidence. In retrospect, people laugh at that speech, say, oh, Carter talking about his malaise. What they don't realize is that at the time, it was very popular. Oh, really? Um, Carter's, in the two or three days after the speech, his popularity rating went up like 10 points, which is an enormous jump. And people felt as if he was talking to things that were troubling the nation. What happened after that is he shook up, shook up his entire cabinet and fired a bunch of people, and there were still more economic problems. And so then he continued a downward popularity spiral. But the speech itself, was very good. Did it have empathy, empathy, should... confidence, and a plan? <laughs> <laughs> it it had. <laughs> um, it was yes, it did. Now that I think of it, <laughs> and I had not really put that grit on it, but but um, yes, I'll try to find some important speech that that has that. And then then the speech in between is one I was involved with, which would very consciously had the um, <laughs> the empathy, confidence, and the plan, which was the energy policy speech. Okay. This was something that Carter gave about uh, shortly after taking office. He was sitting in a room at the White House. He was wearing a cardigan sweater as opposed to, and was not sitting at a giant desk. And he was uh, just sitting in a chair with a cardigan sweater. He was wearing a sweater, as he pointed out, because the thermostat in the White House had been turned down because uh. this was during the energy crisis. So uh, it was empathy for how disorienting it was to have you know the first... Um, Western world consciousness of energy shortages. Confidence was, yes, we're going to deal with it. And plan was, here is my energy saving plan, which we will introduce to the Congress next week. So that was uh, that one I was uh, involved with. And so Carter's career, you can say, has uh, has speeches at some of his road, uh, it, road posts. That was the moral equivalent of war. I heard, I heard his... Yes. And would you like to hear? <laughs> so is that a phrase you had heard before that speech? No. There's a reason I ask. No. So, um, <laughs> if only they'd listen to me. <laughs> so here's how why I say, if only they listen to me. Um, I contend that for people who really are steeped in American politics, as I am, the most important essay in all of American life is one that was published in 1910 by. William James, the philosopher, not Henry James, the novelist, uh, but you know, related, but, but a different person. And this speech was called The Moral Equivalent of War. And its argument was the following. Um, William James was of a generation where many people he knew had been in the U.S. Civil War. The U.S. Civil War was ruinously destructive. Still more P Americans died in that war than any other war because, of course, Americans on both sides. It was just it was an entire catastrophe. And William James said, from this entire catastrophe for the country, we know from people's stories and their memoirs and the histories that also some of the noblest traits that people ever display, they displayed in this most horrific of activities. They sacrificed for their country. They sacrificed for each other. They endured pain, blah, blah, blah. So he said, this is the challenge. We know that wartime can bring this out. What is the moral equivalent of war? How can you bring out the best in people without bringing out the worst in people? So um, Jimmy Carter had heard of this um, speech, as I had too. It was something when I was in college, I actually studied and wrote about uh, this, I mean, the, the, the William James speech. And so somebody suggested, maybe Carter, maybe me, maybe Hyman Rickover, who was a Navy admiral, who was one of Carter's mentors, suggested using that term in the speech because it exactly expressed what we were talking about, trying to have a wartime spirit without having an actual war. So my argument was, yeah, you can use that, but tell them what it means, <laughs> because nobody will have heard of this. And people will think either you're talking about some kind of holy war, you know, a moral equivalent of war like a jihad, or they're just going to use the acronym uh, MEOW, which is what they they did, you know, mm -hmm. just making some fun of it, moral equivalent of war. I say, if you spend another two sentences explaining, we're going to try to use all the, 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 the bravery and the ing ingenuity and the inspiration that are brought out by war. But with, but for a right. for a, a noble cause and but did they listen to me? Oh no, 
<laughs> so if they if they listen to me, it would be I've been known as the moral equivalent of war speech with the explanation. Now it's just the moral equivalent of war speech. More than you wanted to know, but now you're. <laughs> Do you not. think there's some <laughs> parallel now because that was an energy crisis? Now it's a a COVID crisis. Yes, yes, and and it's something that would have been. Yes, and, and as a technical matter in the U.S., the public health service is um, actually a, mili- a branch of the military. These people wear uniforms, they have ranks, and so you could make this uh, a military, a peacetime military activity. The way you, the U.S. military has been well used in recent years is for things like um, after a tsunami or after an earthquake around the world, often uh, logistics experts from uh, Air Force planes or Navy ships will go to Indonesia or they'll go to some South American country and try to offer aid to people. So we could use that in the U.S. right now of having a moral equivalent of war to um, make the nation strong and robust and resilient against a new sort of um, challenge. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. I mean, are they doing that? Is Biden's (laughs) planning? I think that there, I imagine this will be um, the plan. As you and I speak, we're in this horrible period where all the official authority is with the current administration. There's there's zero authority whatsoever in the next administration. Mm-hmm. And there is a entire throwing a switch changeover that happens at 12.01 p.m. Eastern time on January 20th. So the Biden people have been careful not to say anything about what they would do, but the man who is Biden's chief of staff, uh, Ron Klain, who I've known for a long time, his job under Obama was running the anti-Ebola oh, wow. uh, plan, which was very successful. And they did have this whole sort of uh, what they call a whole of nation strategy for using public and private resources to get uh, vaccines out, to figure out who needs them first, to let states do what they're best at and have the federal government do what it's best at. So I believe that starting on at 12.01 on January 20th, We'll begin to see some of these steps. Well, this, pod- we sh- this podcast will come out in about two months, so probably we can't be can't be too okay, topical. Okay, so uh, <laughs> yes, as we, as we look back, I hope that people see twelve oh one on January twentieth as a time when things change. Yeah, <laughs> we'll be able to see that as well. Okay, and it is is I, I can so let me ask you as as a student of some of your podcasts and of 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 what have you been surprised by or learned about source of inspiration as you've had such a range of people from a range <laughs> of backgrounds you know what, what what surprised you and how would you do you think about this differently from a wow, year what's ago the reporter or two years ago? Always the <laughs> Well, it's just every every because I'm stuck in the south of Italy, so my conversation is very limited. I can just be people on my family and friends. So, having this project has thrown open my doors. I would never get to speak to someone like yourself without this podcast platform. So it's been been transformational. So I've got to speak to epidemiologists, psychologists, mm-hmm. yeah. um, writers, lawyers, authors, all types of fascinating people, and everyone's. Everyone's been inspiration for a song, so that's kind of the minimum level. <laughs> what kind of what subject would you think for a song about about this conversation? What do you think are the are the themes? So I'll tell you, people who don't like me or my work, what they would say, <laughs> and then people who who uh, have followed me and my work, and then have a sort of creative tension to see where this all leads. So the the people who uh, I've written, you know, uh, of the books I've written, 10 books is not something like that. Yeah, and there's there's a, a, a variety. I've been on a number about Asia when we lived there and a number on sort of how to think about a democratic society. My book on the press, Breaking the News, and some others I did, you know, way back, back, back early on. In a way, uh, this latest book, Our Towns, is also about how to think about democratic governance. The people who don't like them would say they're uh, naive and Panglossian, and somebody who is a an older white man 
who, although from a modest background, I, I got a fancy education. And so it's easy for somebody who has those cushions You're in life. You're a Rhodes Scholar. I mean, that's, to a, think, that's cream of the crop. I was a, a, a Rhodes Scholar. And that's, and that's when, um, when I actually lived in England. We got married at the, the College Chapel, the Queen's College Chapel, and lived in the little town of Headington for our first uh, year of, of married life. Um, so it's, it'd be, say, oh, it, it's easy to think, uh, to look only on the, the, the bright side of, of, of things. Um, so l- I'll just put that down and go to, to the other side is that I've done a lot of things which are really critical of the press and of a number of actors in uh, the democratic system now and to uh, trends in technology and to trends in China and, and Japan. I was uh, not a fan of Japan during the time I lived there for reasons I, I can get into. And people would say similarly, oh, um, this is somebody who is not able to look past his own perspective and just sees things. Oh, who is? Um, I mean, you know, for, that, that, how, you know exactly. So I, I think that, that that the reason I love being a reporter and feel as if I've come into the job that makes most sense for me, even though I was planning to be a doctor when I grew up, as my as my my dad was, is that there is since we're all limit, limited by our own experience, our own, the, 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 the things good and bad that happen to us, there is no closer way you can come to sampling other people's lives than spending your time just asking yeah, them. Yeah. You know, and the, the, the joy of, of this, this work is just being able to say, well, what do you think about this? And, and what's important here? And how do you understand this? I mean, as you know, from the podcast world, when I was in college, uh, I ended up spending most of my time in the college paper and was the editor of it. And there was a then famous journalist. I say then famous journalists, the renown of journalists does not last even like one day after their, their last article. There's a then famous journalist named Harrison Salisbury from the New York Times who came to talk to all of us in the college paper. And he said that something that he found enlightening about reporters is that by nature most of them are introverts and shy and they welcome the structured excuse to have to go out and engage Uh, and the reason to be able to be the person saying well how did this happen tell me about this how does this work what are you thinking what do you know what would you like to know and that that is true of me i I was uh (laughs) part of this hbo film there's a scene where I'm, i'm i'm telling them if I'm just out on the street someplace, I'm not going to talk to anybody. But if I'm out of the street reporting, I'm going to be asking everybody and say, you know, tell, tell me about this. And so it's, um, I think that, and, and this is going back to say the the song of, uh, the song of my professional life is without my having thought of it before this second, the same as the plan of the speech. <laughs> I was giving you that it is empathy, confidence, and a plan. Um, empathy because you want to think everybody's going through things and everybody is having a hard time and everybody has hopes and everybody is the star of his or her own drama and everyone else is, is sort of a, a, a bit figure. And you, you need to be aware of that. Everybody wants to have some kind yeah. of hope. And if you and and societies, if you don't, that's really hard to to get up each day. And that the story of you know people have an ultimately <laughs> predetermined arc. You know, none of us is going to be around here forever. But but there are so many examples of people figuring out ways that they, their families, their children, their communities, their companies, their nations can rise to better rather than worse that it's worth recognizing the difference between the better and the worse. And the plan is that it's fascinating to know how did you do this and that people can do things better if, you know, if they understand the science of podcasts or the science of websites, or the science of growing orange trees or the science of whatever else. So that would be, again, I, I have no musical talent whatsoever, although I used to play the piano, but it's um, <laughs> those two things can sim- sort of be true, at least for me. Um, but I, I so th- that is, um, you're the person who has the musical gift. Well, a, a speech is is basically a song <laughs> unsung. So. It, it, it mm. should be, yes. That is a, a way of putting it. It's the, the lyrics of a song and, and good, um, the greatest, which leads us to the greatest speech Obama ever gave, 
um, which was after a time of terrible hardship, which was his amazing grace speech and song in Charleston, South Carolina. This was, I think this was probably two or three years after, uh, I mean, before he left office, it was after this horrific racist mass murder in a black church in South Carolina. And Obama gave a speech on the theme of grace. And it was an elegantly written speech, like a poem and like a song. And at the end of it, Obama by himself sang Amazing Grace. And you could see, I don't know if you, you remember this, this speech. The, the, oh, it is, uh, I promise you, it is, if you start watching, you will not stop. I was actually flying an airplane <laughs> when the speech was being broadcast live. I was landing an airplane in Gillette, Wyoming. And the way airplane radios work is whenever the control tower is talking, it blocks out what you're listening to, as mm -hmm. it should. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'd be, I was hearing on Sirius XM radio, I was hearing Obama's speech, and then say, you know, turn left, heading 250. And so I, I'd miss five seconds and then uh, hear the speech. But when I landed and I heard him singing, I thought, could that possibly be Obama? If you watch the video of this, you'll see Obama having given this eloquent speech. I think the most beautiful speech an American president has given wow. in my lifetime. And then for 30 seconds, you see him standing there silently in a crowd of you know, 500 people or so, mainly black crowd of people you know who've lost loved ones. And you see him deciding whether to jump yeah. off, whether he's on the edge of the cliff, is he going to jump? And then he begins to sing. And he's not that good of a singer but he sings by himself for about 20 seconds and then the whole congregation joins in but it is it is speech as song it is drama it's communication in all different levels at once and you will not be sorry to would you like this. to have written speeches for obama of course <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> it's it's um yes so jimmy carter wasn't is a brilliant man in sort of the analytical terms. Um, I once wrote that on taking an essay, uh, taking a sort of multiple choice test, he would be the best. Um, he was a brilliant extemporaneous speaker, which is as with that law day speech. He never learned the particular announcer type skill of delivering a An set art. speech. Delivering a speech from a teleprompter is hard and you mm -hmm. have to learn it. And it, it is, um, and he thought that was sort of not worth not worth doing. And so he, his formal speeches, the ones I was mainly involved in, were generally seen as not good. Mm. <laughs> so I am, if you can think of, uh, you know, think of some sports team that has a losing record and you're their coach. I'm sort of that counterpart to have been a speechwriter mm. for uh, Carter is seen as having been the coach of a, or, or a, a manager on a, uh, a losing team. But Obama, but Obama would probably have been demanding to write for because he is a very good writer, and he you could see him wanting to do more of it, the more uh, more of himself, the more he could. Um, so R Ronald Reagan would have been um, Ron Ronald Reagan and Obama are the two best deliverers right. of speeches. In in Ronald, uh, Bill Clinton was also a very good extemporaneous speaker. One time, the teleprompter went down for half an hour in a State of the Union speech, and he just kept talking, <laughs> uh, sort of like. <laughs> uh, but but he was not a good, not that good of a formal. You don't remember no. any lines from Bill Clinton's speeches. Um, so, yes, yeah, so it would be fun to, to uh, it would be like being the coach of a championship yeah, team. Yeah, because it makes the writing so much, I mean, if you're writing for Martin Luther King or a great orator like that, then it's just, they're, I mean, they're actors or musicians or performers. It's yeah, fantastic. And I assume it's like writing a song, but but you can tell me where the the actual language and the person who's going to be delivering it they need to be yeah. to be matched you know that a martin luther king speech delivered by gerald ford would not sound or but delivered by john major or whatever would not sound uh natural and so so it is a matching the music of the language the cadence and the stress and the assonance with that own with a speaker's mm. voice 
and natural emphases is also part of the the, the songwriting dumb. I actually, of it. I interviewed Iyad El Baghdadi, who was a commentator on the Arab Spring, and he um, he has this web podcast called Arab Tyrant Manual, which was based on around Arab Spring. Everyone was tweeting the the typical things that dictators do. You know, they say it's the youth's fault. They turn off the internet. They send in the police. They blame the so I the foreigners. So I um, I did a speech from a fictional dictator. And, and sung that. So I have, I, thinking back, I have actually done once. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that, that one I have not heard, but I will seek that. If you seek out Obama's speech, I will it's seek out deal. that one. <laughs> okay, great. Well, we've got a few, mo few more minutes to finish up here. So if there's anything else, um, yeah. well, I think I've got enough for a, a classic song. So, so um, I, I'd love to just ask you some more questions <laughs> if I could. And, uh, so, so I will... Um, say for people who are watching the U.S., who've been watching the U.S. from outside in these past few years, has the U.S. So I've been alive long enough to have seen the U.S. in a lot of troubled mm -hmm. times. I was uh, living and studying in England during the late stages of the Vietnam War and during the Nixon Watergate times. And the U.S. was most uh, allied countries were very much against Vietnam and against Nixon, et cetera. And during the Reagan era, there was a lot of European versus U.S. friction, although you know, the U.K. was much more sort of on Reagan's team uh, under, under Thatcher. Um, in Japan and China, there have been ups and downs with, with the U.S. The question about the excursion of the past couple of years is whether the relationship between the U.S. and the world of which it would like to feel its part, has that changed in a recoverable way uh, or, in, in, or in a irrecoverable way? What, what is the, the the irrecoverable argument would be they've shown us that that anything is mm -hmm. possible, that anybody can end up in this job. We can't take anything for granted anymore. The the other argument would be, OK, they bounce back. They find ways to, to recover. How do you weigh those sentiments, you know, outside the U.S. looking well, on I now? Think Trump was quite universally unpopular um, for most people. But I'm, I'm English, but I live in Italy. So and we have we don't have a great prime minister over there either. So, you know, the same mm -hmm. hairdresser, pretty much the same, same divisive <laughs> policies. And <laughs> so. But you know we're all under this pandemic now, and, so and, and, everything, all the bets are off. You know, so. You know, but I think we've had uh -huh. bad leadership all around the world. So he's dragged down. Yes, he's certainly dragged yeah, so down with the exception of everything. I think. Yeah, uh, New Zealand seems to have been well run mm -hmm. for this last while uh, in terms of the, the, the pandemic. And so, so, what's what is daily life in Southern Italy like at this stage of the well, pandemic? We're still under lockdown. I'm not we have mm. red orange and yellow zones and if you have too many cases in your town or your comune then currently we're in a red zone so we're not allowed out the house only for supplies so it's it's pretty strict and is that in enforced in a way that people take seriously yeah, people are self-enforcing because they're very worried about the virus so mm. but in march back in march when it was a serious lockdown we all had the police on the road so people get fight they're worried about a fine of a thousand euros so that's enough to keep them in yeah, yeah. and are, when when this is over and you can travel will you stay in italy <laughs> i don't know i don't know what's going to happen i i think for the moment yeah i've been to amsterdam a few times but um it's not a pleasant experience traveling and i'm not sure if we'll have to have these asian style um, passports where you have your vaccines in um mm. And I wasn't going to get the vaccine myself. I just was going to wait to see see what happens with it because you never know, do you? Yeah, and, and I, I can be a, a guinea pig for you. I'm, I'm going to get one as soon as as I can, and uh, I'm eligible as part of you know for generational reasons, but which I think will be you know not immediately, but sometimes as a matter of weeks as opposed to months here. And so I will let you know how, how it how it goes. You know, by, by chance, um, Anthony Fauci, who is uh, big in U.S. virology, lives just a block away, so <laughs> we're in his force field for. For, for, for getting so he, info. He's going to be dishing and, them out on the street. 
I think he got his about two weeks ago, and they're going to be doing it through uh, the hospitals here and also some of the big um, pharmaceutical chains. The, the two big ones in the U.S. are CVS and Walgreens, and so I think they'll they'll be. So far, it's only been hospital workers who have been getting the vaccine, but I think they're about to open it up to people generally, uh, sort of on a age and is triage. Biden, is Biden is, a, um, is his priority basis. wants to get things back to normal as possible. I, th- I think that the priority is is that the economy is not going to recover until people can travel and dine and meet and all that. So the idea is to, to get them vaccinated as, as soon as, as, as possible. And based, uh, I, I am happy again to be an experimental candidate for you, and I can tell you how <laughs> how, how it goes. And uh, so, so that then then economic and civic life can follow that. And Deb and I have been following. A lot of our small oh, towns yeah, um, by Zoom call, yeah. yeah, and it's they've been finding inventive ways to keep going. The challenge for all of them is that what's been kind of the spark of many small towns over the last three or four years has been small startup independent businesses, and those are the ones mm-hmm. that have been hardest mm-hmm. hit by uh, by just the collapse of of entertainment and dining and travel. So finding a way for them to get going again is you'll, is have, to, you'll have to go back and do another trip because to see what it's pre and post pandemic yes uh, that that is um what we very much plan to do and one reason why we want to get vac- vaccinated and and back at the dawn of time the first time i went to europe we actually had to have uh those vaccination cards this is back in the early 70s and you had to have an, a yellow fever vaccination mm. card then uh, partly because we've been to africa but in those days you had to have a little card showing yellow fever and malaria so this is a a back to the future <laughs> <laughs> will be experienced your HBO for us series what would that be called is going to be called um our towns the same name as the book and it was we filmed it in we went back with them to six of the places where we had done reporting in the book and uh it's it is not a it's a an action it's not action. It's not like a crime show, but it's not a sort of documentary public broadcasting talking heads thing. It's mainly the stories of people in those places and the ways in which they've done things. You know, uh, agricultural workers who've come from Mexico to inland California and how, how they've they've lived and people in the coal industry in West Virginia, how they've uh, adapted to the post coal life and pe- lobster people, young lobster people in Maine and how they're adapting to rising water temperatures and et cetera, et cetera. So it, it's a it's a very beautiful documentary. I can already see in my head. Imagine you flying, <laughs> flying over these different changing landscapes and how man's altered the landscape. And, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, and it, it's they did a number of scenes <laughs> with me flying the plane and a camera person in there because HBO, in, they had this really high end camera, a two person camera crew, but they insisted for them to go with me in the plane, we had to take out $10 million of insurance. And it's impossible to get $10 million of insurance for a little plane. So instead, my wife Deb held the camera oh. <laughs> in the plane, so all the area shots are by amateur um, camera person Deborah Fallows, but she did a good job of it. <laughs> Gosh, what a team! <laughs> so we all we all adapt. Really? Well, I can't wait to see it. That's so inspiring. I, I will let you know, and I can also there'll be a screener ready in two or three weeks, and I can send you that ahead of time so That'd you can be see great, it before man. it comes out, just as part of your of your creative. Um, Maybe I can try to stimulate you. Yeah, to. <laughs> Let this all ferment and see what comes out. Yeah. Brilliant. And and it's I should say I really respect and admire so much what you've done. I think you're really using the opportunity of the pandemic and the technology of podcasting just to create something that well, wasn't exactly. there before. I, thanks to the pandemic. Thanks to Corona. Yeah. <laughs> it was lovely chatting to you, James. Really informative so, and inspiring. Thanks so much, Jack. And I, I will be in touch electronically and enjoy Italy. <laughs> thanks very much. Take care. Good luck with the vaccine. See you. In our town we have pride We don't form factions or divide We chose to come together And together we decide By ourselves we don't wait For the government or state To help us with our problems We fix issues that we face We are 
as one We rise together or not at all We share a future when we stand tall In our town we made changes to get young people to stay by giving them the helpful breaks They can do things here their way And our town's always growing While keeping heritage It isn't small, it isn't big It's perfect as it is We are united We are neighbors To get things done We work as one we rise together, or not at all We share a future, when we stand tall Our town was made from what we do Our town was built by me and you Our town's alive our town is true Our town is black, our town is white Our town is red, our town is blue Our town's the color of me and you It wasn't drawn up from top down We raised it up out of the ground Our town has roots Our town's foundations Our town is living our town is great simplicity Our town is honest Our town is free Our town will go on living long Our town is stable Our town is strong This is our town Look at our town It is our town We love our town Thanks for tuning in. Of all the podcasts in all the world, I'm glad you chose to listen to this one. Thanks for taking the time. If you enjoyed it, please rate it on your podcast app, share it. Um, if you like the song, you can listen to it on Spotify, Deezer, iTunes, everywhere. If you really want to support, you can buy it for a dollar from podsongs.com and send it, to, send it to a friend by email. Try and spread the love. I know nobody downloads anymore, but uh, yeah, what can you do? And I'm also joined Patreon as well. So if you really want to support, you can sign up there as well. Thanks for all your messages and your words of encouragement. I do appreciate it. And thanks to my musicians, Mauricio Sanicola, Massimino Vodza, and my researcher, Dori Verber. All right, see you next time.